We should never allow the government to decide what is acceptable speech and what is unacceptable speech. Um, we, should, we should penalize behaviors, not opinions, and not speech. Uh, if you start trying to regulate speech, you start trying to regulate uh, thoughts, you start trying to regulate beliefs rather than behaviors, uh, there's no way that you're not going to abridge the constitutional rights of millions of Americans. This video that I'm making is to emphasize that if we don't remember what happened to the children in Aleppo, to little Omron and what he went through, if we only remember how they are now. Thank goodness they're safe, they're uh, protected, they aren't in pain, they're not suffering. But if we don't remember how it all began, if we don't remember what they went through, then it'll just keep happening over and over because people will forget. And I would say most everybody in America has already done that. Today in this country, when you bring up the name Omron Dagnish, you might have a half a dozen people who even remember. But the majority of the people in this country don't remember anything. And I hear all over the world I hear from different people who still remember Omron and what he went through in Aleppo and the other children who who suffered in the weeks and the months after the uh, the attacks in 2016 and 
you know, they use the the entire thing as a as a as a an exploitation of uh, war, and then others like Obama used it as a as a PR gimmick to help push himself in the public eye as being concerned, being interested in these in these children who uh, were hurt in in these attacks by the Russians and the. Uh, uh, the whole thing was just used for an end to a means by the politicians. And since that time, people just haven't really thought it was important anymore to even bring it up. Um, but that's why, for me, I want to keep sharing about this story because one day I know there are going to be people who will want to know more about what happened to Omron and to his family. And these, these are the last pictures I ever received from uh, Abu Ali, uh, Omran's father, in Aleppo. Now, he, he did close his Twitter account, uh, but I'm seeing indications that he is still out there on Twitter watching. He has two, he has two different accounts that I found uh, in the last month. Meaning that even though he doesn't want to have that interaction like he was having with the public, I think he still is interested in wanting to know what happened um, to the, the majority of the of, of the world. How do they still relate to Omron if they even say anything? Uh, I'm hoping that through my videos that I post that he'll see that people have been touched by this in such a... Uh, exponential way that it's not something that's a fad. It's not something that just happened and some people remember it and then others don't. I still truly believe that the more we bring this subject up, the more you'll keep the public's awareness open that suffering continues around the world in different ways. You've got uh, the exportation of children in certain countries, uh, you got slaves. Uh, slavery still exists in certain parts of the world, and uh, definitely still children suffer in other parts of the United States and in the world itself, where they're using biological weapons, they're using children to uh, exploit uh, one side of a war or the other. I'd say that's why Omron was seen by so many people because they were hoping to gain sympathy from the world for the for the cause of the rebels who were fighting against uh, Assad. And to this day, Assad himself, who is the president of Syria, has said this never happened. He still says that what happened to little Omron Daknish did not happen at all. They say that's a fake photograph. But then you, you reach out to his father, you reach out to other people who were there, and what do you get? You get a true picture. It was true. It was real. It did still happen to Omron. It still happened to his brother, Abdullah. It happened to his, his older sister, Roa Ah. Um, they all went through these things. You saw them in the ambulance. And uh, the tragedy is that in America, there's not been one network that's ever brought this subject up. You've got other countries... Sweden, uh, Russia itself have done, uh, even New China TV have done stories since uh, Omron's father came forward and told the public and told the world that uh, Omron is safe, he's okay, he's not hurting anymore, he's, uh, he's doing fine. But I try and hope that maybe we might learn more facts about what happened to him after he was in the hospital. Did he have complications uh, from his injuries? Did um, uh, how did he recover? How was his his uh, recuperation period as far as how how did he cope? Because if you remember, after they lost their home, you think where did they live all that time up until uh, last year in 2017 when we finally heard from his father in June. Up until that point, nobody had heard from Omron for, for almost a whole year, and we didn't know what had happened to him. So, this many networks across the, the world that are still showing interest and have done stories about Omron, it tells me that 
there's somebody out there who's wanting to bring the story uh, in a, a larger context. Hopefully somebody is going to do some sort of a, a, uh, a motion picture or some sort of a, uh, a large-scale um, media promotion, like a film or something that they'll tell the world all the facts of what happened to Omron from the time he was hurt uh, to the time that he finally decided, at least his father, that the story was uh, something he didn't want to remember. So that's why he cut off all the communication he has done since. He wants a normal life, and I understand that, but to leave it where you just know he's okay and that's the end of the subject is like saying, you know, he doesn't want to share with people anymore any other facts and it leaves a lot of closure left open about certain things that should have been talked about in those few months from June of 2017 until the end of that year and into the early part of 2018. Uh, that was the only chance anybody had to communicate with Abu Ali uh, or any, any other people that knew Omron who did interviews with him. And now you're not getting any feedback even from the people who still are actually uh, still on Facebook and on Twitter. You don't hear anything more from those people. So hopefully, if I can continue to reach out to people and share how I feel about this little boy, little Omron, maybe other people have other facts and they'll continue sharing and then we can keep the public aware of what did happen to him. Every day on Facebook I get more and more views from people who see my channel or my page and they go on and they just want to know what happened. And that's very encouraging because it means there's a lot of other people who knew about what happened and they don't um, intend just to forget about it. They want to know what happened to them if they never did look into it or find out facts about what did take place. And that's my hope. The more interest people have in this story, the more chance there'll be that his father will re-establish that contact with everybody that he knew uh, who asked questions about Omron, about what had happened to his family, what what is happening today. Um, he was willing to share photographs of his children and though he wants to go on in life, at least he could try, I think, to to see how much what happened to his family affected millions, billions of people around the world. That's my hope. Share, continue to reach out, hope someday Omron's father will again try to communicate with the world and say, this is how we're doing today. Um, I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for anything except the opportunity to continue to share how I feel about this little boy, little Omron, with his father and with his family because I truly say this, I do love and I care about his family because I know how hard it's been for them about the attack, about how the public was seeing this one side of the story and then he's told everybody since then that uh, he, he was exploited. He said, I did not ever realize until after the fact that they had done this to help their cause and that it wasn't just to show the suffering of the Syrian people uh, of the of these attacks. It wasn't his intention that he would allow them to photograph Omron or any of his family for that reason. He said, I didn't even know they were doing it. So, what I'm saying to Omron's father, if you're watching this, what he went through, little Omron, it affected so many millions of people all around the world. And we don't want this subject to go away because we know it continues in other places besides just in Aleppo. I'm sure it happens in Damascus, it happens in uh, in Lebanon, it happens in, in, in Cairo, it happens in Tel Aviv, it happens everywhere. All it did is to open up the eyes of the world to the suffering of, of the children themselves, to this little boy, to the others who are hurting and suffering from uh, these horrible acts of hate and war and just the downright in inhumanity of uh, children being exploited for one reason or another. And I don't really ever want that to um, 
be something that people forget about because it's still going on today. So if you have children, and I don't, I have no children, I have no wife, I would say to you, watch more of the videos I post, but hug your children every day. Appreciate them, love them, care about them, because I know Abu Ali cared enough about his son that he said, I want the world to know what happened to him. I want the world to know what happened to my family. But then it, it went so far with that, and then he just he just cut it all off. He, he stopped. And I think the world wants to know because they care about him. They care about his family. They care about Omron himself, uh, how he's doing, how he's continued on in his life since it happened. And that's my prayer, is that his father will reach out. His father will try to communicate with the world in the in the years to come about what's happening to Omron. My personal prayer is that I might hear from Omron himself when he gets older. He might reach out and and share of how he felt that night in the ambulance. Uh, he has said to a Swedish reporter, um, I was not scared. Uh, I was not... Um, you know, he wasn't worried of what was going to happen to him because he's, he, he, I'm sure he felt he was safe now. He was no longer in that situation where they were going to bomb his house. When the bombs went off, his father said he was thrown underneath their sofa. And he said, the only thing I wanted to do at that moment was to get them out of the house, get them out of that predicament where the, the building could come down on him. And he wanted everybody, all of his children were, were brought out first. And then as soon as he was able to escape with his wife, he did. And uh, thankfully, all of his children, his wife, all of them are safe today. Uh, that's of uh, about three, four months ago. But we, we don't know what's happening to him since that time. But I'm just hoping that Omron's father will reach out to us again in the future. And if he does then it'll give us the chance to always share and con continually reach out to him and say, we're not going to forget what, what this little boy, what little Omron went through. And it might upset some people to see this photograph of him, but it is a testament to the suffering that continues to this day in every place on earth uh, about men, women, children, uh, who continually are suffering in these situations. And that's why I'm continuing to share about Omron, because I don't want people forgetting about what happened in Aleppo. Uh, and, you know, people kept saying different ages. Omron was three and a half when this happened. And now he's almost six years old. And as he grows older, uh, I hope he'll never forget what happened to him. Uh, every moment he was in that ambulance, every moment that he was in the uh, in his home recuperating, his his head healing, everything that he might one day recollect all of this and and share it to, in, in some some way, either through a motion picture or through some video on the internet, that he would tell people how he felt and what he went through. It's so hard getting translations a lot of times from what his father shares. Some do translate it into English and other languages, but then some don't. So it's like you are left to hope and pray you can figure out what he was saying in those situations. To this day, I have an audio of Omron the day that his father came forward and told the public what had happened to him. And I still have no translation of what he said. I still have no idea what he said in that video. It was done by uh, one of the reporters from Syria. Uh, who knew his father, and he had all of his children uh, to go on uh, basically a smartphone, and he asked Omron different questions. And we can only assume Omron was saying, um, I was hurt, I'm okay, or, you know, I'm just speculating what he said. I don't know what he said. But I'm hoping somebody one day will translate what Omron said in the interview. And it only lasted at most maybe about maybe a minute. Not even that. Uh, the video was very shaky. His his hand was shaking it back and forth because he's trying to hold it while they're filming Omron and his, his, his siblings. And we still don't know what he said. 
to this day. So I'm hoping that uh, all these facts will come about over time. We'll find out what these things were, what he said, what happened, uh, how his father feels to this day uh, about what he wants the world to know about what happened to, to his family, to the Dagnish family, what it was that made Almron so important. Not just the fact we saw him, but that this is an ongoing tragedy all over the world about suffering, the suffering of children, uh, suffering of men and women. And uh, I, I, I strongly feel, like so many others, that we must keep this in the public eye. We have to share, we have to talk about this little boy, because if we don't, then it means more and more children will be hurt and killed, and um, what he suffered would be in vain, that nobody would know anymore or remember what Omron went through. And for me, I'm never going to forget what I saw when I saw that little boy in that ambulance. I'm never going to forget that. And I hope that none of you will ever forget it either. Thank you.